Welcome to Raving Ryan. I'm your host, Ryan Anastasio. Today, we have a very special guest, the former governor of Connecticut, Jody Bell. Governor, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming governor of Connecticut and some of the challenges you faced during your career? Wow. Um, you know, when I first ran for office, I ran for the State House of Representatives. Yeah. And uh, when I ran, uh, the fellow who was the state rep there before me uh, decided not to run. And uh, he had been there five terms, 10 years. Yeah. And I remember looking at him and saying, David, if you don't run, I'm going to have to because mm -hmm. I can't think of anybody else I'd want to do the job. And he yeah. said, well, that's perfect because I thought you'd be perfect for it. I said, I'm joking. <laughs> and I learned quickly you don't joke about that. But um, yeah. I ran. I won. And I didn't think I'd stay there. I figured it's a part-time legislature and that I would go up and serve a couple of terms and, um, and then go on with my life. And um, as it turned out, I think I did a good job. I enjoyed it. And I think the best part of that job was that you got to work for constituents. I mean, you always do, but you really got right yeah. in there and could work with constituents. I learned more being a state representative than I think anything else. Um, you learn how to draft bills. You learn how to get people to hear your bills. Yeah. You learn, frankly, uh, what it takes to get it passed. And so I enjoyed that very much. But it was, I don't want to call it a stepping stone. I never looked at it that way. But I, um, I was very much in love with government work. Not yeah. the politics, mind you, but mm -hmm. the government work. Uh, then I went on, as you know, to become lieutenant governor. Yeah. And then uh, when the governor resigned, <clears throat> excuse me, when the governor resigned, I became governor because yeah. that's the way our constitution is written. And then uh, I ran in my own right and won. And after um, six and a half years, I thought, it's time to move on. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question, but most of it. <laughs> in 2004, John Rowland due to, uh, resigned due to contractors using state money to make improvements on his home. Um, you were lieutenant governor at the time, and all of a sudden you became the governor of the state of Connecticut. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like when John Rowland resigned and how difficult the transition was? I'm going to tell you first a funny story. Yeah. Um, the weekend before he resigned, um, I was in Brookfield at my home. My son yeah. was there visiting. My daughter lived in Colorado. And the phone rang, and uh, my son answered it. And I hear him going back and forth saying, uh-huh, yep, yep, she's here. Hold on a minute. And I, and I went, who is that? Who is that? <laughs> and uh, he goes, it's the governor. So I get on the phone, and he said, uh, I'm having a meeting uh, at the residence tomorrow morning yeah. at 9 o'clock. I'd like for you to be there. I said, OK. He didn't tell me anything else. And um, we hung up. The next morning was Monday. By the way, that was Father's Day, as I said. And uh, so on Monday morning, I go to the residence. And um, he said, um, would you like a cup of coffee? And I thought, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, sure. And uh, he said, um, let's go get a cup of coffee. And I get the coffee. And I can tell you, because I was nervous, it was going like this. And I'm like, uh oh, I better sit down. <laughs> and um, he looked at me and said, uh, I've decided to pull the plug. Patty and I talked about it. That was his wife yeah. um, over the weekend, and I'm going to resign. This is now like the 20-something of June, 22nd by then. And um, I said, when? He said, July 1st. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, but I have to tell you, it's not like you plan for it. But I remember going to a lieutenant governor's conference, and one of the lieutenant governors, who later became governor of Mississippi, remembered him telling me a story. He said, always, not just me, but all of us, he said, keep a note card with you. Because in his case, his governor had been in a very bad accident. Yeah. And he had to be sworn in as governor. He said things like knowing who's going to swear you in, uh, knowing who the staff is, knowing all of these things. He said, just keep that in mind. I yeah. thought, well, I'll never need that. Well, of course, now I do. Yeah. And um, most people win an election in November, and you get time to plan for the inauguration yeah. in January. I had, uh, what, 12 days? <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, we wanted to keep it low key. I mean, the state was facing some very difficult challenges. And I think that at that time, I've said this before, and I don't mean to demean myself yeah. in any way, but I think what the state needed at that time was a mother. 
Yeah. Somebody to put your arm around the state and say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I'm going to take care of things. So I did. Yeah. And um, you, you said that you felt betrayed and you felt like you were punched in the gut when, he was, uh, when you heard about the allegations. Um, I'm wondering, what, what has your relationship been like with John since? Sadly, I haven't seen him or, okay. or heard uh, from him. But I have to tell you, I always liked him. He was funny, yeah. smart. Um, and I think that you know it was a sad day in Connecticut's history when you look back. But we didn't look at it as, you know, we're going to dwell on this problem. Looked at it as, how are we going to fix it? Yeah. What are we going to do in the future? What kinds of things can we do to change how corruption, um, whether it's in the governor's office or in the mayor's office, because at the same time we saw several mayors who were getting in trouble yeah. around the state. So one of the things I did was to change the bidding process on how you go about bidding on a state project so that no one got favored treatment. Let me give you an example. Um, if you have the same five or six people opening bids every time, yeah. and let's say you're one of them, and I think, <laughs> if I make good friends with Ryan, you know, and he knows that I know he's going to be opening the bid and yeah. he's going to be looking at all these things, um, maybe I'll get preferential treatment. Well, what I did was say, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to do um, random, so that it's not the same five people every time opening the yeah. bids, which made a big difference. Um, there was no favoritism, if you will. And then, of course, there's campaign finance reform, which we'll save for a later yeah. question. <laughs> and were you, were you disappointed to see that John Rowland is back in prison now? Very disappointed. Yeah. Very disappointed. Um, the Democrats always had a majority in both the House and Senate during your tenure as lieutenant governor and as governor. Um, how difficult was it to work with the other side and get things done for the people of Connecticut with, with such a divide in the legislature? It was difficult. Um, a lot of what we do is generally, generally uh, bipartisan, and it gets a lot of support. I think the two biggest problems are always finances, taxes, um, and the budget, which we yeah. are seeing, of course, what's going on in Hartford right yeah. now. But um, I remember that there were several times when I would veto legislation and uh, mostly budgets, and um, the Democrats would override the veto. So yeah. it was very frustrating not to be able to get the job done. Yeah. But for the most part, other than, again, the budget and the financing of yeah. said budget, uh, we got along fairly well. There were times, you know, when we would sit at the table. I remember a couple of meetings at the governor's residence. We had this big, beautiful dining room table, and um, they'd pound their fist on the table, and I'd say, stop, we don't need that. And then one time, some of our staff was, um, they were standing out on the porch out in the back, and they were getting bored with us being inside yeah. and um, not knowing we'd hear a little yelling here and there. Not me. I never yelled. But I remember one young man was playing with a golf club, and he was swinging it back and forth. And of course, he hit the light overhead and broke it. And um, I think it broke the tension for us, because what were we going to do? I mean, you know, I felt bad for him. And he's like, I didn't mean it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it, it made all of us relax and realize yeah. that you know we're here to do a job. Let's, let's focus on what we're trying to get done right now. Yeah. So it was difficult in a lot of ways, but I also think that um, having the background of being in the General Assembly was very helpful. I can remember one piece of legislation. Um, it dealt with drugs, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, being arrested for a certain amount of drugs and what have you. And I remember going to the uh, representative who was a very good friend of mine, Democrat from New Haven, Bill yeah. Dyson, and I said, Bill, I can't support this bill as it's written. If you pass it, I'm going to tell you I'm going to veto it. And uh, he said, oh, you can't do that. It's so important to us in the cities. It's, you know, we have people that are apprehended, and we don't want this. And I said, Bill, I'll work with you to help get this bill written correctly, but I can't support it the way it is. And uh, he appreciated that. But I had known him from my legislative days. Yeah. So there's. There's a lot to be said for having that background and having that experience, and I think it helped. Yeah, and currently in the legislature, there's a, a tie in the state Senate and a very close margin in the state house. And what do you make of how they're working with the, not, not, there's not a, a one-party rule in there right now. Um, what do you make of it, how they're working in the legislature right now with the Republicans with having some say now? Well, I think that, uh, I think it's good for the state to have 
that voice and to have that um, voice heard. Yeah. I mean, it makes, I think in the back of everyone's mind, it's like, oh, well, there's no, no point in trying to yeah. get anything done because as I said, I had, I think, 21 vetoes and, you know, it's, uh, it's frustrating. But I think the Republicans need to not only tread carefully, but use their newfound power yeah. judiciously. Don't just try to block legislation, and they're not. I mean, they are working in a bipartisan manner in so many different pieces of legislation. Yeah. I was just reading one before we got together today, and I thought, it's good for them. Republicans, Democrats yeah. coming together. But it's always the budget, yeah. and it's always the tax package that's going to hold everybody up. And for that, we should be very grateful that it's a little bit closer, because it forces them, both sides, yeah. to give and take a little bit more. And um, currently, the state of Connecticut's in a fiscal mess. Um, the defi deficit keeps on rising, but businesses keep on leaving, and the legislature cannot agree on a budget. Um, this is not news that, see, that Connecticut is having financial problems. Um, when you left this governor, there was around a $3 billion deficit. Now it's currently around $5 billion. Um, governor Malloy um, has previously, previously said that he inherited a lot of these problems in the state. Um, would you agree with that? Well, let me just put it this way. Yeah. He's been governor for seven years. Yeah. He had the two largest tax increases, yeah. uh, over $2 billion. And um, as he once said, um, it's my responsibility, and yeah. I think he understands that. Okay. And um, ha um, have you talked to Governor Malloy lately and giving him any advice on the current uh, issues in the state? No. no. Um, you know, I always think that it's important for yeah. either previous governors not to try to insert yeah. themselves with the current governor, and the yeah. same is true with presidents. Yeah. Um, you know, when you leave office, that's, you know, you've left office. It is now the responsibility and the job of the current office holder. Yeah, and currently the state is trying to pass a budget for the next two years. Um, there was a great divide between Republicans and Democrats in the legislature and with Governor Malloy. Um, in 2009, there was also a budget crisis where you worked under executive authority for a few months. Um, do you think this budget is similar to the one in 2009? Uh, we went till September that yeah. year, and uh, that was the longest that I can recall ever yeah. having to wait to get a budget, but we couldn't agree. And yeah. uh, try as we might, we, you know, there was a lot of give and take, and I think by the end of August, actually I shouldn't say that because I remember the income tax yeah. debate, that went till August. <laughs> um, but I think that right now it's because, of, as you mentioned earlier, about the, yeah. the number of people that are holding office, you know, Republicans and yeah. Democrats, that it's, it's a little more difficult right now because each side is staking their own territory yeah. and they want to make sure my voice is heard. But they're going to have to come to an agreement. Yeah. And whether it's going to be the end of June, July, August, uh, it has to be done. Otherwise, the governor will run on a continuing resolution, which means yeah. that each month it's month to month on the amount of income that comes in, and that's what we're dealing with. And that's no way to run a state. Yeah. And um, Governor Malloy he wants to cut a lot of the town aid that's being sent to towns like Woodbridge and Brookfield. Um, do you think that's a good way to solve the, the budget crisis? Yeah, I'm not going to second guess the governor. Yeah. Um, I know that he has he has to make cuts, yeah. and there are very few places where there are cuts that yeah. can be made. But to do it at this late stage, giving yeah. municipalities virtually no heads up yeah. uh, when they've already started their budget process, and in many cases the tax bills are going out this week, uh, is not the time to do it. I know the legislature, in a bipartisan way, yeah. passed legislation the other day that allows municipalities to come back and adjust their tax bills. What happens right now is when your family gets a tax bill, they get it for the 1st of July yeah. and the 1st of January. Well, if the legislature changes and you get less money in your town, you've got to make that up somehow too. So this basically would allow towns to change the dollar amount come yeah. January of next year, which has never been happening before or has not been able to happen. But I think that you know that municipal aid is probably one of those things that we try to hold um, above all else yeah. because you don't want to take that away from municipalities. They have no recourse but to raise taxes. So yeah. you're going to do it at one end, you're going to reduce the burden, but you're going to make yeah. the towns pay more. If you can find it somewhere else, if you can make other concessions, by all means look there first. Yeah, and while it's not official yet, Aetna is reportedly looking for a new headquarters. Um, Aetna CEO Mark Bertolini and other Aetna officials have acknowledged that they are looking to move out, move out of Hartford. Um, Aetna has been in Hartford since 1853. Um, Governor Malloy has told Aetna to tell him what other states are offering and, and he will offer something better. Um, what do you make of the possible departure of Aetna and are you concerned about it? 
course, I'm concerned about it, whether it's Aetna, GE, yeah. United Technologies, any of our major companies that have been here for a while. We want to keep them here. Uh, I did see that uh, Mr. Bertolini said the other day that the move would be only for their top yeah. people, so it's not affecting the, quote, 6,000 people that work for Aetna yeah. overall. Um, but it's still a big nut for us to have to swallow. We don't want any company to leave. Yeah. But I want to make it clear, it's not just the taxes. Yeah. Everybody thinks, oh, well, we tax so much. And yes, we do. It's, it's unfortunate. But it's not just the taxes. Yeah. It's the attitude. And that's what companies are seeing. They're seeing uh, the legislature. And again, it's been controlled by one party for too long, the governor's office. They're saying, what they're seeing is uh, a, an attitude that says, well, it, when we run low on money, we're just going to tax the rich. Yeah. Um, we're going to continue to add these various pieces of legislation that sound good and make, make us feel good, yeah. but they don't do anything overall for the picture of Connecticut. And I can give you examples of, and, and again, I'll give you one from my days in the legislature. Yeah. The, the legislature passed bill that said, for example, uh, made it a parameters on who could collect workers' compensation and yeah. unemployment compensation. I had a gentleman one time who told me he fired an employee on the spot because he had been drinking and he had to operate machinery at, at his job. He said, I fired him right there. He walked out the door, walked down three blocks and collected unemployment compensation. Yeah. That's not fair. And that's what companies are saying. When Connecticut passes laws that are detrimental to not only businesses, but to the survival of a company uh, with poor legislation, things that sound good in principle, but don't work in reality, then that's what companies are driving at. They're saying, not here. I'm not going to do business here. And that's a problem. Yeah, and Governor Malloy, his strategy is, he's saying to Aetna, um, go, f go uh, tell me the offer that they have in another state, and I'll make something better. Do you think that's a good way to try to no, get into the state? Um, and you, we should be doing it up yeah. front. I mean, we should. I'm not saying that it's always the right thing to offer a company incentives, but we all do it because if a company says, hey, look, I'm going to create yeah. 1,000 jobs over 10 years, and we say, great, what can we do to help you? Well, you can help us build a new building. You can help us bring us up into you know, the 21st century. Yeah. You can do these things for us. By all means, we should be willing to help. And we get in return a commitment for jobs. But you don't go to a company and, or any company and say, well, if they offer you so much, we'll match that yeah. and do better. That's not the way to run a company or a state. Yeah. yeah. And you said that, um, you, like you said, um, they're not leaving because of the taxes uh, mo Fire. mostly. And um, they're going to places like New York and Boston, which are big cities, which are driving a lot of people. Um, how do you think we can make Hartford and New Haven and other places in Connecticut like Boston so we can drive in people? We're never going to be Boston. Yeah. I know the governor said that the other day, and he was right. We're never going to be New York. But we have so much to offer in Connecticut. Yeah. We have, uh, you know, in New Haven alone, I look at it as the college yeah. city, but look at the arts, look at the city, look at the yeah. vitality of the city. And if you, you know, if we can do more of that in our cities. Um, I think that we will continue to have companies that say, yeah, you know, there's a good possibility here. Young people, we have colleges now in yeah. downtown Hartford. We've moved the, the campus of University of Connecticut from West Hartford to downtown. When you get that, that uh, mass of young people, they're going to yeah. want to do something after class. They're going to want to get something to eat. They're going to go have a beer, perhaps. Yeah. So they're going to want to hang out. That makes the city even thrive a little bit more. And then once we start doing that to all of our cities, whether it's a college or something else that attracts them, then I think we'll continue to grow business here. In the meantime, we have an attitude problem, yeah. and we need to address it. Yeah, and have you heard any information about Aetna? Do you think they're going to, um, have you heard if they're, if they're uh, going to leave the state? I mean, it's not official yet, but they're reporting it. But have you heard any inside information to I prove that? I have not. Okay. Um, the Wall Street Journal on Saturday had an article that said that income ta tax collections in Connecticut declined for the first year since the recession. Um, and it said that Connecticut has thus reduced its two-year revenue forecast by $1.46 billion. And this is after 247,000 Connecticut residents have left the state in the past five years and moved to no-income tax states like Florida. Um, do you think this is a result of the tax increases imposed by yourself and Governor Malloy and the wealth earning more than $500,000? I think it 
it has um, some bearing, but yeah. again, it's not entirely that. I think the loss in income, if you read, I know um, our Commissioner of Revenue Services has yeah. said that a lot of the higher income individuals did not do as well. That may change, yeah. obviously, this year with the stock market doing well. You might see an increase in the threshold uh, or with the income with individuals. And so those tax receipts will probably look better next yeah. year based on that. But in the meantime, with less income, I'm talking about the yeah. individual now, their income uh, from stocks, bonds, dividends, interest, you know, not just salaries. Yeah. Because again, according to the commissioner, we're seeing the income tax that people are paying through payroll deduction yeah. really hasn't changed. And if anything, that has actually gone up. We're actually seeing more revenue because people are making more money than, than they did. You know, They may have gotten a pay raise or something. Um, but it's that wealthy group that says, yeah. I'm not going to put up with this. Yeah. I'm not going to have my income tax at a higher bracket continually. Yeah. Once in a great while, I yeah. think I could handle it. I understand it. But I think if you look at the paper, and, and I know I've been reading lately, the answer again for certain individuals, certain segments is tax the rich, tax the yeah. rich. And it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And so do you think we should... Uh, maybe move that 6.99% bracket uh, maybe down to like five like it was before? When you're looking at the budget deficits that we're facing right yeah. now, I think you're gonna find it very difficult to move anything down or not tax. Um, I know at the beginning of the legislative session, I say that, I mean, would I like yeah. to? Absolutely. But I think that yeah, there, were, there were bills out there to not tax um, social security earnings, for example. Yeah. Um, Again, they're counting on income right now that, yeah. that is what they're basing the tax collection on. Uh, would I like to see it? Absolutely. But I'm not sure that it's going to happen. And um, um, the governor's race in 2018 is a long way away. Um, there are some candidates already out there that have announced. There's also people with exploratory committees. Um, is there anybody, either Republican or Democrat, that you like that may be running or is already running? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not, um, not for any particular reason, yeah. but um, I actually had someone call me the other day and ask me if I would support them yeah. um, in 2018. I never get involved if there's a primary yeah. uh, or if there's a potential for a primary because there's probably going to be at least 15 or 16 yeah, yeah. different people. I'm sure there will be a primary. Um, but no, I, I think that uh, it'll be interesting to say the least, but I think yeah. that um, the conventions will kind of... Yeah obviously outline who will win, uh, well, who will win the nomination. So we'll go from there. Yeah, and why have you chosen not to get involved in any campaign since you left as governor? Um, I've never really been involved in too many campaigns yeah. uh, locally uh, or on the state level or, frankly, on the federal level. Uh, it's just not something that I think is appropriate for someone yeah. who is out of office. Mm -hmm. And I want to move into some national issues right now. Um, the first few months of the Trump administration have been very interesting. Um, President Trump has been trying to get things passed on things such as health care and tax reform, but the Russian investigation keeps on hanging over him. Um, what do you make of the first five months of the Trump administration? Not much. <laughs> I think that um, I think he's trying to do some things, and uh, I certainly try to give him credit. But um, I think for every two steps he takes forward, he seems to take one back. Yeah. And um, frankly, I think if I were President Trump, I'd stop tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any other suggestions for him? Like, I mean, uh, you, you had to work with Democrats um, uh, while well, you were governor, and he, he's been trying to just work with Republicans like he did in health care. He only got Republican votes. Um, how do you advise him to try to work with the Democrats and get Reach some Democratic out. votes? Reach out. I mean, it's so important that you have a dialogue with both sides of the aisle. And also let them know what your plans are. I mean, you can't just spring something on somebody and say, yeah. this is what I want. I expect you to pass it. Um, yeah. It doesn't work that way. I, you need to, one, you need to do your homework. Yeah. You need to know what you're going to put out there, how it's going to affect people, how much it's going to cost, what are the odds that it's going to pass or not pass, um, how do we work it so that if it does pass that we get the most votes yeah and we get people who are actually interested in this legislation. And I'm not talking about the health care per se. I mean, he's certainly got that, but he's got um, a whole host of things that are coming yeah. along. You can't do it in a vacuum. You simply can't. Yeah. You have to have the support of, in this case, both sides of the aisle.
Yeah. I also think that, you know, there's a little bit of that, um, you know, we're in charge. We know best, whether it's the legislature or the, the yeah. president. Um, it can't work that way. It, it can't be a one-sided story. It has to be a compromise. Yeah. And people have um, continuously talking about connections but with Russia and the Trump campaign. Um, recently, some things about Jared Kushner, he was meeting with a Russian banker, came out. Um, do you think uh, the Trump campaign had any ties with Russia? I have no idea. Yeah. And I'll wait to find out, just like you. Yeah. And I want to finish up with some personal questions. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, do you have any hobbies? I love to read, yeah. and uh, that's probably my best hobby. I, you know, if you call that a hobby, uh, yeah. I enjoy reading. And uh, my my friends are always loading me up with new yeah. titles to read, and um, so yeah, that's it. What kind of books do you like to read? I like historical fiction. Yeah. Um, you know, I like uh, I read uh, the first daughter. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, the president's daughter, first yeah. daughter, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was based on um, fact, but uh, it was a novel. So. But that's, you know, I like a good summer read too, yeah. you know, light book, something you can put down and pick up later, anything. Yeah. I read anything. <laughs> and where do you get your news from? Uh, mostly online. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, do I do subscribe to several of the Connecticut news outlets yeah. and uh, that type of thing. But, uh, and I read a few newspapers. I don't subscribe too much anymore, but yeah. uh, here and there. And we ask this question to everybody we interview. Um, Connecticut is really well known for its pizza restaurants. Some people will call Connecticut pizza heaven. Um, do you have a favorite pizza restaurant in the state? Um, um, no. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I, am, I would eat any pizza that was put in front of me. Yeah. I mean, I, it would have to be horrible not to eat it. Um, so I don't have a favorite. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite in like the Peppies versus Sally's? Even? No, not really. Yeah. I, I guess, no, I can't say that I really do. Now, when you get to cheese steak, that's a different story, but that's a Gino Auriemma thing. So. <laughs> um, Governor Rella, to thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for watching. Um, you know, if you're on YouTube, you can go to ravingryan.com to watch this. We recently just updated our website. Um, please follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and follow my Facebook page, Raving Ryan. Thank you for watching. Reporting for Raving Ryan, I'm Ryan Anastasia.